Hello and good evening, good day everyone. It's great to be back once again with all of you. How hope you had a wonderful weekend and are ready to learn a bit more, find out find out a bit more on acupuncture as this is our topic tonight. And it's lovely to have you here for sure. And as you can see, we do have another special guest. Uh, Mike Berkeley is with us. Hello, Mike. How are you feeling tonight? It's great to have you back. Hi, it's so nice to be back and it's lovely to see you. Thank you so much for allowing me to participate. Thank you so much for agreeing to participate as well, because we always uh, love to have you as our presenter. Uh, Mike has been with us before. He had provided some of the previous webinars, of course, of acupuncture, but also uh, Chinese uh, medicine herbs. So it was definitely interesting to have you as our expert. And I'm very happy that uh, tonight you will um, talk, take us through acupuncture and how it can increase chances of uh, getting pregnant. And of course, so we will start with uh, Mike's presentation. But afterwards, I guess your favorite favorite part will start. Uh, your chance to ask your questions. So anything that's on your mind, anything that is in, of interest of you for you, uh, Mike will be definitely happy to answer. And for those who don't know Mike Berkeley yet, let me just uh, remind everyone that uh, he is the founder and director of the Berkeley Center uh, for Reproductive uh, Wellness. And uh, he is right now in New York City. Uh, so it's the mid of the day for you, Mike, but I'm glad that you've decided to support us and uh, once again present uh, for uh, my IV offenses. And before we start with the presentation, let me just mention that uh, my IV offenses, we are part of European Fertility Society. And we are here to, again, support you, give you the chance to ask your questions, meet top fertility experts. But as you know, we don't only focus on the medical part. We also focus on uh, some emotional support, uh, psychological support. Uh, but uh, tonight and this week, we will also talk about other therapies like acupuncture, but also hypnosis that can actually help you out. So anything that uh, can uh, can help. Um, we want to make sure that we will talk about all those aspects as well. I'm Caroline, your host as always. And now, uh, Mike, I guess you are quite ready to start with your presentation, right? I'm, I'm ready. Excellent. Thank you so much. Let's go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so here we are. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody for attending. I'm honored that you're here to, to hear my presentation. And um, I'm very excited to be here. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some various things that can uh, perhaps interfere with fertility. And I'm going to speak about how acupuncture and herbal medicine uh, may improve your chances of conceiving, as well as most importantly, staying pregnant and giving birth. So here we go. So I'm going to talk a little bit about polycystic ovarian syndrome. Uh, some of you may even have this or know somebody that does. Uh, patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome uh, have a difficult time ovulating. Sometimes they don't ovulate at all. Sometimes PCOS patients ovulate every month. There's a whole spectrum from minor to severe pathology. Um, it's basically a disorder of anovulation. Uh, these PCOS patients have a difficult time ovulating and uh, their hormones are out of balance. They have high levels of insulin and high levels of testosterone, and frequently uh, patients are uh, morbidly obese, which is dangerous for the heart. Uh, it can cause gestational diabetes and hypertension during pregnancy. 50% of PCOS patients are normal, have normal bodies. PCOS patients are twice as likely to miscarry than the non-PCOS population because the egg quality is typically compromised due to having too much testosterone, which is perhaps uh, causing uh, the estrogen not to function properly. So uh, acupuncture and herbal medicine have a regulatory effect. They, they delete or drain that which is in excess 
and they support and give that which is deficient. So in the PCOS patient, there's too much testosterone. So as you can see here, uh, acupuncture has a regulatory effect. It often uh, harmonizes and regulates the follicular state. Um, and this will uh, kind of try, attempt, we, were going to, uh, we, we will attempt to balance the testosterone and the estrogen, which will essentially lead to better egg quality, which can reduce uh, the, the possibility of, uh, of miscarriage and increase the possibility of a, a full-term uh, pregnancy and a live birth. Of course, as I put on the bottom of the slide, the best outcomes um, are those to be found when combining uh, complementary medicine with Western medicine. So acupuncture doesn't really give anything to the body. They're just stainless steel needles. There's nothing in the needles. So what does acupuncture do? It stimulates blood flow to the reproductive organs. So what? Here's the so what. The FSH and the LH from your brain gets to the ovaries. How? Through the blood. When you eat, the nutrient products from the food get all over your body, from your eyebrow to your nose to your ovaries. How? Through the blood. When you inhale oxygen, every cell and every tissue in the body becomes oxygenated. It needs to be to survive. How does the oxygen get there? Through the blood. So acupuncture enhances hemodynamics. It enhances and strengthens and facilitates blood flow. So when utilizing acupuncture for the patient that's faced with the fertility challenge, we're specifically trying to facilitate improved blood flow to either the ovaries or the lining, the endometrium, the uterus, or in men, the testicles to improve the sperm. Uh, so that's why and how improved blood work, improved blood flow can uh, actually elevate and enhance the chances of conception. Now, herbal medicine is something that you literally drink, and it has uh, absolutely, um, it's very different than acupuncture. Acupuncture moves energy, moves blood, but herbal medicine actually serves in and of itself to nourish uh, different parts of the body. Uh, and, and of course, the the herbs that I that I use and that herbs the herbs any acupuncturist would use to help facilitate conception are herbs that are going to have an effect on the ovaries or the testes or the lining, and so uh, I treat with acupuncture twice per week. I treat every patient gets treated twice per week, but they take herbs twice per day, seven days per week. The acupuncture is working from the outside in. The herbal medicine is working from the inside out. So combining acupuncture and herbal medicine is the best way to go. Um, one thing I would like to say that's very important, herbs come in many different formats. You can drink them from a bottle with a, an eyedropper that you put them under your tongue. You can take pills or you can take raw herbs. The raw herbs are the best way to go. They are fresh. They can be customized exactly and specifically for each single individual patient. You cannot do that with pills, and you cannot do that with a tincture that you put under your tongue. So I only prescribe customized raw herbs. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about endometriosis. So for those of you that have it, you don't need to know about it. But for those of you who don't have it, I'll just tell you a little bit about it. And for those of you who do have it, I'll tell you how acupuncture nerves might help you to get pregnant. So endometriosis is a disease where endometrial tissue, that is to say uterine tissue, is found in parts of the body other than the uterus. This is completely abnormal. The uterine tissue only belongs in the uterus. And when this uterine tissue finds itself in other parts of the body, it reacts to hormones just like the uterus itself. <clears throat> so, for example, if you have endometriosis in the intestines, when a woman menstruates, she may bleed rectally. If she has endometriosis in the nostrils, when she menstruates, she may bleed through the nose. 
endometriosis is an autoimmune disorder and it's an inflammatory disorder. Now, there are a couple of reasons why endometriosis negatively impact fertility. One is because it causes tubal damage. So when a patient has endometriosis with destruction or obliteration of the tubes, IVF must be done. But many times in the endometriosis patient, IVF doesn't work. Why not? Because even though endometriosis is a disorder that takes place outside of the uterus, these pro-inflammatory cytokines, which in English means, you know, inflammation, in inflammatory things, find their way into the uterine cavity. And so the oven is turned on, but it's turned on all the way up. So it's a very poor environment in which an embryo is expected to thrive. And so pregnancy uh, very frequently is not to be had. So can acupuncture and herbal medicine help? Well, first of all, if a patient is diagnosed with endometriosis, uh, acupuncture and herbal medicine is not the next step. The next step is to do a laparoscopy and to have the endometriosis removed. Once that happens, the inflammatory proteins that find their way into the uterus go way down and the chances for conception go way up. Now, sometimes a patient can have a laparoscopy. She's 30 years old. The sperm is fine. The eggs are fine. Everything is fine. She's had a laparoscopy and she cannot get pregnant. Why not? Well, endometriosis has a specific color to it. It can be what's called powder burn, which means it's black and white or gray. And some endometriotic tissue is purple or red or black. So when the laparoscopic surgeon is in the pelvic environment, uh, he or she will cut out this tissue that is discolored. But some endometriotic tissue looks exactly like normal tissue. So the doctor is not going to resect that which looks normal. But yet, even after the laparoscopy, the patient still has endometriosis. So in this case, we can test to see, in fact, if she has endometriosis by doing a test called the Receptiva DX test. This is a test done in the States. I'm not sure if you have it in Europe, but you must have an equivalent. And it's an endometrial biopsy, and it determines if a certain molecule is present, it's called BCL6. And if BCL6 is elevated at all, it means the patient has endometriosis, even though they've had a laparoscopy. Now, they're not going to get another laparoscopy because the tissue looks like normal tissue. So the doctor's not going to even know what to do once they're in there. Now is the time for acupuncture and herbal medicine. Why? Because acupuncture and herbal medicine, in the case of the endometriosis patient, can serve to suppress inflammation. And inflammation in this particular type of case is what is causing infertility after the laparoscopy. So a person with endo can have normal tubes and still not get pregnant for the reasons that I've stated. So if any of the listeners have endo and you've had a laparoscopy and you still aren't getting pregnant and you're in your 30s, let's say, or it doesn't matter. You're in your 40s. It makes no difference. You still can't get pregnant, and you've had a history of endometriosis. You've had the laparoscopy, still can't get pregnant. Do acupuncture and herbal medicine to reduce, not eliminate, it will not eliminate, but to significantly reduce the inflammation, and that will have a very positive effect on your outcomes. Let's talk about advanced maternal age. So what is advanced maternal age? Advanced maternal age is any woman who's over 35 years old. So <clears throat> you have to look at this arc. Over here, you're 13 years old, you start to menstruate. Over here, you're 52 years old, you're in menopause. On the top of the arc, you're 35 years old. Once you're on this side of 35 years old, your fecundity, which means your ability to conceive in any given month, starts to decrease. Fortunately, it doesn't decrease like this. It decreases like this, slowly over time. Nonetheless, 
once you're 35 and older, if you're having a problem getting pregnant and you don't have polycystic ovarian syndrome and you don't have endometriosis and there are, there's no male factor involvement, then why is it that you're having a problem getting pregnant? Two reasons, generally. <clears throat> Low ovarian reserve and poor egg quality. Acupuncture and herbal medicine can do nothing to Im increase the quantity of eggs that any woman has. However, acupuncture and herbal medicine, as discussed previously, can serve to improve egg quality. I have many patients that are in their 40s, and though many cases fail, many cases succeed, where uh, before they got the acupuncture and herbs, they did six IUIs and five IVFs, and they didn't get pregnant. So advanced maternal age is something that frequently, though not always, can be successfully treated with acupuncture and herbal medicine and often combined with IVF. But remember, IVF is a mechanical issue. You remove the egg, fertilize with the sperm. Now you have an embryo which you transfer. That's it. If you have poor egg quality or poor lining quality or poor sperm quality, the reproductive endocrinologist has no power to alter those issues acupuncture and herbal medicine do. So this is why the gold standard for reproductive medicine should be East meets West. Hopefully one day it will be that way. So as a woman gets older, as we just discussed, what are the two main reasons for infertility? Though there are many, but what are the two main reasons? Low ovarian reserve and poor egg quality. <laughs> so in the context of poor egg quality, what you will find, what one will find, is that often the eggs, uh, or the embryos rather, are chromosomally abnormal. So acupuncture and herbs can never take a chromosomally abnormal embryo and make it normal. But I'll just briefly give you the, the trajectory, the passage, the pathway of an egg. And, and, and an egg resides in a follicle. And you have follicles that are quiescent. That means they're sleeping. They're quiet. They're dormant. They're not doing anything. They're tiny, tiny, tiny. They're measured in micrometers. And full-grown uh, mature follicles are measured in millimeters. A, a, a mature follicle is a 20 millimeter follicle. So it takes three months from the primordial follicle, the sleeping follicle, to become a 20 millimeter mature follicle. So when you do acupuncture and give a patient acupuncture and herbs for three months, what we're trying to affect is not the follicles that are four or six or eight millimeters. We're trying to affect the primordial follicles, which take 90 days to become a mature follicle. So we're hoping to affect the primordial follicles. So by the time they become mature follicles, you will have a better egg within the follicles. Low ovarian reserve, as we said, acupuncture and herbs cannot increase ovarian reserve, um, unfortunately. Uh, women lose a thousand and one eggs every month. Uh, a thousand die, which is called atresia. Atresia means cell death. Uh, so a thousand eggs die and one is ovulated. So unfortunately, uh, acupuncture, nor herbal medicine, nor any Western medicine can give you more eggs. But I will tell you this. If you have a regular period, it can be 26 to 35 days. But if it's regularly 26 days, regularly 35 days, and you ovulate at least 12 days before day one of your cycle, day one of your menses, that means that you have some good eggs. I'm not going to explain why, because we'll be here for two days. But it means that you have some good eggs. The problem is you don't have enough good eggs. So every time they do a retrieval, you're getting a bad egg. And so the purpose of acupuncture, again, is to give you more good eggs by working on the primordial follicle. So we're not going to give you more eggs, but maybe we can give you more good eggs. 
So we talked a little bit about this before, but just to, to go over it again briefly, um, we, acupuncture will increase the delivery of oxygen, electrolytes, nutrients, and hormones, and it will help excrete dead cells from the follicular environment, leading to improved egg quality. Let's talk a little bit about male factor. Depending upon what you read and where you read it, uh, the, the data says uh, that male factor contributes from 35 to 50 percent of infertility. Uh, so often you have a case of male and female factor. The wife is uh, 39 years old. She has low ovarian reserve and poor egg quality, and the man has poor morphology and low sperm count, uh, various combinations of these things. So these are the things that you're typically going to find that are affected in the male. Low sperm count, poor morphology, which is the shape of the sperm, poor motili motility, which is the ability of the sperm to swim in a straight line, and sperm DNA fragmentation. Um, a sperm DNA fragmentation assay is hardly ever done, uh, though it should be done. The problem with sperm DNA fragmentation is that the sperm will not penetrate the egg. Now, what the reproductive endocrinologist will say, and I respectfully disagree with this position, is that it doesn't matter that the sperm can't penetrate the egg. We'll do ICSI, which is intracytoplasmic sperm injection, meaning we'll just take the sperm and inject it into the egg and make an embryo. But often what happens as a result of this is you get a bad embryo. Why? Well, because you're, you're forcing in a bad sperm uh, into the egg. So I, I, anytime I have a patient, a male patient that has poor sperm parameters, meaning count morphology, motility, I always send them for a sperm DNA fragmentation assay. And if they have that, we can work on that as well. Let me give you some data about sperm DNA fragmentation because it's important for you to know. If a man has DNA fragmentation of 0 to 15 percent, there are good fertility outcomes. 15 to 29 percent, there's good to fair outcomes. Sperm DNA fragmentation above 29 percent, there's no pregnancies. And so there is no treatment uh, in Western medicine. Acupuncture and herbs uh, work very, very effectively in reducing uh, the percentage of sperm DNA fragmentation. So I don't care if I get it to zero. I just want to get it between zero and 15. And so uh, acupuncture and herbs are very good at treating all of these things, low sperm count, mor morphology, motility. It's very effective in treating all of these things. There are certain things, obviously, that acupuncture and herbs cannot treat. So if a man has uh, an anatomical defect in the testes, he's had a varicocele, or he has congenital bilateral absence of the vas deferens. Uh, acupuncture herbs will do nothing. Um, if he has a genetic abnormality, um, microdeletion of the Y chromosome, acupuncture herbs can do nothing. But there are many, many, many men that have uh, these kinds of problems that you see on the screen that do not have physical anatomical issues and do not have genetic issues. These are idiopathic pathologies, meaning no known cause. Nobody knows why the man comes in with low sperm count, but he does. Uh, and let's, let's wipe hormones off the table because his testosterone is completely normal. Everything is good, but he still presents with these things. This is very, very common. Acupuncture and herbs are not the way to go. It's the only way to go because Western medicine offers nothing. Okay, we're going to pass the slide because we already spoke about it. So here's this stat again in the middle. You can see what, what I just said written out here. There's no Western medical response to this pathology. Acupuncture and herbs are very effective. So this is a nice little slide. This is infertility due to no known cause. 31-year-old woman comes in. She's married to a 32-year-old man. They've been checked out. Everything is totally fine. <laughs> and <clears throat> they're not getting pregnant. And they've been trying for two years using an ovulation predictor kit. <clears throat> and so they go to a reproductive endocrinologist. And the reproductive endocrinologist says, uh, I don't know why, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know why you're not getting pregnant. 
which is a completely legitimate thing to say. You know, nobody knows everything. And in 10 years, we're going to know more than we know now. And we know more now than we knew 10 years ago. So science and medicine <clears throat> are constantly evolving. But these cases do exist. Idiopathic infertility, infertility due to no known cause. Now, the beauty of Chinese medicine is that the, the, the word no diagnosis or idiopathy, no known cause, doesn't exist in Chinese medicine. Every single pathological presentation is diagnosable in Chinese medicine. Uh, this is a very complicated subject. Um, but, and again, so I don't want to go too deeply into it because I don't have that much time, but just trust me when I tell you that when a patient, when a couple comes to me that's 30 years old and there's nothing wrong with them, I will find something wrong with them and I will treat them and they won't always get pregnant, but frequently they will. Thank goodness. And so if you have idiopathic infertility, do not, uh, run to donor egg. And don't even run to IVF yet. Uh, do a couple of IUIs if that doesn't work. Try to find a, a, a reproductive um, acupuncturist who's very knowledgeable and, and try to do that route. Um, you know, in your early 30s, you have enough time to fool around with this stuff before you start doing IVFs. If you're 40 years old, I'd say do an IVF or, you know, when certain conditions do a donor egg transfer. But if you're in your 30s and there's no known cause, uh, I would recommend trying a course of, of treatment with acupuncture and herbs first before you do IVF. Uh, even if you end up doing IVF, use acupuncture and herbs as well. But what I'm really saying is if you have no diagnosis, don't freak out and don't be afraid. All is not lost. You can still get pregnant. So in vitro fertilization has produced more than 5 million uh, live births. However, there were more transfers than there were live births. So maybe there were 5 million live births and 18 to 20 million transfers. Um, I, I wrote this as obviously to be expected because, as I said earlier, in reproductive and Western reproductive medicine, and by the way, I don't want you to misunderstand, I am very pro Western reproductive medicine. I'm very pro IVF. And I'm very pro IUI. And I'm very pro donor egg. I'm very pro anything that will help a couple have a, have a baby. So I don't want this to sound like I'm anti Western medicine. I'm just trying to differentiate between Western medicine and Chinese medicine. So <clears throat> um, there's been 5 million babies born to IVF, but many more transfers were done. And so why is that? Well, it's because of sperm DNA fragmentation or poor egg quality leading to poor embryo quality. Acupuncture can help change that so we can increase the odds of getting you pregnant and keeping you pregnant. Um, <clears throat> so right here I write to improve live birth rates. Uh, it makes sense to uh, improve the quality of egg sperm and lining. <clears throat> um, this is true with IVF or IUI or just if you're trying to conceive naturally. Um, I am not sure if what I'm about to say, if I have a slide for it or not. So I'm going to say it now. And if we do have a slide for it, then we won't say it uh, later. But I just want to give you some other input. Um, <clears throat> so you know I'm just making this up. It, it, you have to understand when you ovulate. But let's just say you, you ovulate on day 14, cycle day 14. How do you know that? Because you've been using a ovulation predictor kit for three or four months and you see that you ovulate on day 13 or 14. So many, many couples make this mistake. They see the smiley face that indicates you're going to ovulate in 24 to 36 hours. And the woman says, honey, we have to fool around tonight. And they do and they don't get pregnant or they do get pregnant, but sometimes they don't get pregnant. So when you know that you ovulate on X day, on day 13 or on day 14, whenever you ovulate, start having intercourse four days before the presumed date of ovulation. So if you ovulate on cycle day 14, start having intercourse on cycle day 10. Have it on day 10, on day 12, on day 13, and on day 14. Not just on day 13 and 14. Why? Because sperm stays alive in the female reproductive tract for up to four days. So if you have intercourse four days before ovulation and you have intercourse one day before ovulation and you get pregnant, 
that pregnancy may have manifested as a result of the intercourse that took place four days before ovulation. So this is a, a pearl of wisdom for you. Excuse me. So why do women miscarry? Many, many reasons. Aneuploidy. That means a chromosomally abnormal embryo. Subchorionic hematoma. This is when you have, um, it's a blood clot, but it bleeds and it grows. And the Western medical answer to this is bed rest. Now, let me just explain that the subchorionic hematoma is physically adjacent to or next to the implanted embryo. The embryo is growing and developing. At week five, the placenta starts to form. This hematoma is growing at the same time. If the hematoma outgrows, if it gets bigger than the embryo, this is guaranteed miscarriage. So I've treated this not a thousand times, but maybe 30 or 40 times. And I've used only herbs because herbs are much more powerful than acupuncture. Doesn't mean acupuncture is not effective, but in these type of internal problems, herbs are the way to go. And the herbs were very effective and I saved each one of those pregnancies. So if you have a subchorionic hematoma, bed rest may be helpful. You, know, you have to lie in bed for a week or two. You know, who wants to do that? Uh, it may help. It may not help. If the subchorionic hematoma is growing, not good. Get acupuncture and herbs, but herbs are the way to go for sure. Implantation failure. Why does a woman have implantation failure? Well, uh, this is a very deep uh, and long conversation. I'll try to keep it brief. Um, sometimes there's not, enough, there's not enough blood flow inside of the uterus itself, inside of the endometrium. And so the uterus can be 10 millimeters. The doctor will do a transvaginal ultrasound and say you have a beautiful trilaminar 10 millimeter lining. But guess what? You don't. It looks like it's really good. In fact, it is 10 millimeters. It is trilaminar, but it's not a good lining. So this will not yield an implantation. That's number one. Number two, overuse of clomid, clomiphene citrate, can cause suppression of estrogen receptors in the lining. So you, your lining will not respond to estrogen. It will not thicken. You will not have an implantation of an embryo. I highly recommend not using clomid. I prefer if you're doing an intrauterine insemination. Again, I'm not sure of the medicines that are used in Europe. But in states, I recommend that patients use letrozole, um, which is essentially a breast cancer drug, but it does the same exact thing as Clomid without causing downregulation of estrogen receptors in the lining. Um, in any event, if a patient has downregulation of estrogen receptors in the lining, acupuncture and herbs are very good because they're stimulating blood flow to the lining. And so it's going to increase blood flow in the endometrium. It's going to make the lining much healthier and help improve and increase implantation rates. Infection, uh, sometimes a patient can get an, an ascending infection uh, in, the, uh, <clears throat> in the urethra and it goes up into the reproductive tract and it can affect the tubes, um, to pelvic inflammatory disease, uh, you know, chlamydia. Uh, these types of things can, can cause an infection. Uh, acupuncture and herbs uh, are not the way to go with this. This is to be treated with anti antibiotics. Um, autoimmune issues. Again, this is to be treated with Western medicine. So if you have a history in your family of type 1 diabetes or um, rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or MS uh, or vitiligo or rheumatoid arthritis or any type of uh, autoimmune disease, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, you must get a test done called a reproductive immunophenotype 
panel. And this will determine if you have any other hidden uh, autoimmune issues, and they can be easily treated with Western medicine. And this will significantly improve your chances of conception. And by the way, these things not only prevent conception, but if you're lucky enough to get pregnant, they contribute to miscarriage. So you want to get that treated. A thin endometrium, less than six millimeters. This is an interesting topic. What I just read recently was that uh, the lining thickness is not as important as doctors used to think it was. Doctors used to say, we want to see you have a 10 millimeter lining, but people could get pregnant on a six millimeter lining. Now, obviously, if you have a two millimeter lining, you're not going to get pregnant. But uh, I have to review the article again. But I'm thinking really even at a five millimeter lining, you may be able to get pregnant. Again, this literature that I just read, I have to reread it. It says that the thickness is not so important within reason. But certainly, what I'm the real message that I want to give to you is if you don't have a 10 millimeter lining, so what? If you have a six millimeter, seven millimeter, eight millimeter lining, you're going to be fine. Don't worry about it. Um, and then is implantation failure not due to the thin endometrium? Uh, this is redundant. Uh, I put it here by accident. We spoke about it at number three. And so we'll move forward from here. Um, aneuploidy, we're not going to talk about. We already talked about that. Um, this is a nice little graphic of uh, the subchorionic hematoma. Uh, it makes it easier for you to understand. So here's the placenta. Here's the amniotic sac. Um, this whole thing is the uterus. And here's the subchorionic hematoma. So this is kind of an advanced, you know, this is a fetus already. I'm talking about, you know, very early on. If, so make believe this is just like, you know, small, very small. And you see this, this is bleeding right here. So if this gets bigger, this can enlarge. You see this little red piece here? This red piece can go over here. It can end up here. If this hematoma gets larger than this early, early fetus or, or developing embryo, this will cause miscarriage. So I'm not going to speak about it because I already did, but I just wanted you to see the graphic. So we talked about this a little bit. Um, here's another test that doctors don't typically do, uh, which is an utter failure of the reproductive medicine system. Uh, I didn't mean to say system, meaning your physical system. I meant to say the system of reproductive medicine, the system of, of the medicine. Every single woman should be tested for urea plasma. Urea plasma is an infection that can be obtained through sexual intercourse without protection. So if you or your husband uh, have idiopathic infertility and you don't know what's going on, and you get this urea plasma test, only the woman gets tested, and it's positive, you won't get pregnant because this urea plasma is hostile to embryos. Do you know how easy this is to treat? You and your husband take antibiotics. In the States, we use doxycycline. You take antibiotics for 10 days, and you're cured, and then you get pregnant. So when you go to your reproductive endocrinologist, you must respectfully insist that you get tested for urea plasma. This is a hidden pathology. Patients can go for years and not get pregnant, and there's nothing wrong with them except they have urea plasma that was never diagnosed. Okay, here's a little interesting thing here, a very ty a common type of... Um, of autoimmune uh, pathology is, is activated natural killer cells. All women have natural killer cells, killer cells in the uterus. These cells are there to fight cancer. But sometimes these, act, these natural killer cells are turned on. They should never be turned on. They should only be turned on if there's uterine or ovarian cancer. Sometimes they are inappropriately turned on and they view the embryo as cancer, and they spray the embryo with something called TNF-alpha, which means tumor necrosis factor. Necrosis means death. So the, 
the um, the natural killer cell will will then activate the spraying of the TNF alpha onto the embryo, killing the embryo, thinking that the embryo is cancer. This is very easily treatable. One, two, three, no problem with Western medicine. Uh, this is not a test that's an ordinary test that every patient trying to conceive should get, as opposed to like urea plasma. Where you should, everybody should get, every woman should get that test. And by the way, if I didn't mention it, when a woman gets tested for urea plasma, if she's positive, the husband's positive also. So they both take antibiotics for 10 days. Um, in any event, if you have idiopathic infertility, there's no known cause, and you have some history of autoimmune issues in your family, uh, do the reproductive immunophenotype panel, but specifically, you can talk to the doctor about natural killer cells, because that's a very frequent type of autoimmune issue that causes infertility. So just a little point that's off, off the slides. You can see that in this presentation, I'm talking about Chinese medicine as well as Western medicine, because my belief is that, as I said, East meets West and reproductive medicine should be the gold standard, because there are things that I can do that they can't do. They meaning reproductive endocrinologists. But there are things that reproductive endocrinologists can do that I can't do. So we should be shaking hands to help you. Now, there are causes of uh, miscarriage. I, I don't remember if I spoke about this previously, but I, I'll just briefly touch upon it. IUGR means intrauterine growth retardation. IUFD means intrauterine fetal demise. Different names, they mean the exact same thing. What do they mean in English? They mean that you're not getting enough blood flow to the placenta. And as a result of that, this growing embryo, this growing tiny little fetus stops growing because there's not enough nutrient delivery to the placenta. And remember that the fetus excretes waste matter through the umbilical cord to you, the mom, and then you process that and get rid of that. So this developing fetus can't get rid of waste content, nor can it receive proper nutrient product. And so the, 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 the baby, the fetus stops growing and dies and you miscarry. This is why when I treat a patient after they're pregnant, I treat them twice per week for 13 weeks because 90% of miscarriages happen in the first 12 weeks. And that miscarriage can be caused by IUGR, intrauterine growth retardation, or intrauterine fetal demise. So I want to consistently drive blood to the developing placenta, get the patient past the first trimester, and then I give them a hug, and I wish them luck, and I send them home. So it's very important not only to use acupuncture while trying to get pregnant, but continue getting acupuncture for 13 weeks after pregnancy has been diagnosed. So that's it. Um, we wish you all the best luck in growing or starting your family. And I wish you all the best luck, not we, but I. And um, it's been so exciting for me to be able to give you this information. And I only hope that I've been able to shed some light on the mystery of uh, reproductive pathology and infertility. And that I was able to give you some, <coughs> some amount of help. Thank you all very much for listening. And now, of course, I'm happy to, to take questions. so much indeed mike as always you brought a brilliant presentation it's always great to listen to you uh, lots of knowledge lots of experience and lots of interesting stuff you have provided so thanks a lot and as you can see there are plenty of questions right here and more are coming in so let's not waste more time and let's get going with those questions okay well you see that i have this gray beard so you understand that it means i need glasses <laughs> <laughs> sure no problem of course let's I will show you, of course, all the questions right here. Okay. Well. So and shall I just start from the top? 
Yeah, let me show you just one by one right here so you can see it. So from Mary has asked, can acupuncture be of help with donor IVF and how can it help? Um, <clears throat> great question. I, I'm not sure that acupuncture is necessary or useful uh, for donor egg um, unless there's an implantation issue. And sometimes if it is perhaps, let's say, a very thin lining, uh, just the use of estrogen can thicken the lining and make it more receptive. Um, so I don't think donor egg is the best case scenario for the utilization of acupuncture or herbal medicine. Thanks a lot, Mary, for your very first question. Of course, Mike, for your advice uh, as well. Let's have a look. Uh, Derek has asked this question. Do you think both acupuncture and lowered stress is most successful? So this is a very interesting question, um, more interesting than, than, than one knows. Um, I'm going to talk about stress. So <clears throat> we know for a fact, without question, that stress reduces sperm count. But there is no data whatsoever that I'm aware of that indicates that stress has a direct effect on female fertility. And to prove my point to you, I will tell you this. There are wars going on right now all over the world. There always have been, and much to my dismay, I assume there always will be. And in these war zones, and one cannot be in a more stressful situation, I don't care what your situation is, you can't be in a more stressful situation than having bombs dropping all around you and seeing dead people all over the street. In those scenarios, women get pregnant and give birth and have babies. So I'm not sure that stress is such an issue. It may be for some, it may not be for others. I honestly don't know. I know it affects men. I'm not really sure if it affects women. <clears throat> nice, definitely an interesting question. And uh, yeah, that makes sense. What you have just said, of course, as well. Thanks so much. Okay, um, let's have a look about the next question. What about sperm decondensation, right? I, I think that the question is supposed to be about sperm DNA fragmentation. I believe so, yeah. It's really good for you. Yeah. Decondensation may be another term for fragmentation, but I think that's what this individual is talking about. Mm -hmm. So um, acupuncture and herbal medicine are very effective in helping to prevent uh, the onset. I'm sorry, I misspoke. I'm going to restate. I, I apologize. Acupuncture and herbal medicine are very effective in reducing sperm DNA fragmentation in, in men that have sperm DNA fragmentation. So you don't typically see DNA fragmentation in an embryo. You will see it in a sperm. So as far as male factor is concerned, you know, not only do we use acupuncture to improve count and motility and morphology, but we definitely use it to reduce sperm DNA fragmentation as well. Yes. Well, thank you so much once again. And of course, let's have a look. Uh, another question is right here from Amanda. Can any of the herbal teas, chamomile, thyme benefit when trying to get pregnant or do they just help with sleep nerves? So another good question. Um, I'm going to say a couple of things about this. My expertise is in Chinese herbal medicine. And so chamomile and thyme... <clears throat> I know nothing about. I know that chamomile is a tea, thyme is an herb, but it's not really a medicinal herb. And chamomile, I don't think is a medicinal herb. I, I think chamomile, I don't know anything about thyme except that it tastes good. The only thing I can tell you about chamomile is that it, it, it makes you calmer and relaxed and it may help you go to sleep. I really don't think, uh, let me put it this way, I have no experience as to the benefits of chamomile or thyme in the context of fertility improvement. If 
Beautiful. Again, thanks so much for that question. And now let's have a look at the, uh, there was a bit of a longer question here. I am 39 and we have uh, one normal blastocyst. We did pre-implantation genetic screening, plan to transfer in October. Also, I had endometritis and I did laparoscopy in January. How many acupuncture sessions should be, be should I do before implantation and what do you recommend to avoid? Okay, so Olga, thank you for the question. So you had endometritis. So I'm assuming that you were given antibiotics and that the endometritis has been eradicated. Of course, you'll know this because your reproductive endocrinologist or gynecologist will let you know this. Um, and you said you did a laparoscopy. So uh, I'm not sure you did a laparoscopy for endometritis. Maybe this patient had endometriosis. Um, you don't typically get a laparoscopy for endometritis. You typically take antibiotics. Uh, so I'm going to assume that Olga had endometriosis and had a laparoscopy. And um, you say, how many acupuncture should I do before you transfer? So this is a very good question and a difficult question. Um, oh, I see. So you already have an embryo that's, that's a normal embryo. Um, I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, if you've had an endometri, if you've had a laparoscopy and you've waited a month and you're, you're healed and everything is good and the uterus is in good shape, I would do the transfer right away and don't worry about any acupuncture because I mean, yes, do acupuncture because if this transfer fails, at least the acupuncture that you've started now will start to work on those on those primordial follicles. So when you do the next retrieval, you'll hopefully continue to get good eggs, uh, normal eggs after pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Um, as far as this embryo that you have, you can go ahead and transfer it now. In other words, there's no acupuncture that you need right now because you have a normal blastocyst, so transfer it. The only reason to do acupuncture is if you know in your mind that if this cycle doesn't work, you're going to do another retrieval, then start the acupuncture now. So you're working on the primordial follicles for the subsequent retrieval and transfer. Excellent. Again, thank you so much for this amazing answer. And of course, I do believe that it was helpful. However, Olga, if there was anything you would like to add, you know what to do. Um, and in the meantime, let's have a look at the next oh, question. Says, yeah, okay, it's fine. I just, just want to say one more thing about all Sure, this. no problem. Avoid. There's nothing to avoid. I mean, except don't eat terribly, don't smoke cigarettes, don't smoke marijuana, and don't drink too much alcohol. And you can exercise, but don't exercise too, too much because you need to have some fat in your body. You cannot be too thin because estrogen comes from the ovaries, but it's also metabolized in the fat tissue. Those are the things to avoid. Okay, this question. Yes, there is another one. Is it common to experience days of spotting, irregular bleeding in between menstrual bleeding, as well as experiencing anovulatory cycles after a month of acupuncture session? I have PCOS and have a history of irregular cycles. Despite dietary and lifestyle changes during the last two months, I'm not now experiencing anovulatory cycles and spotting. Yeah. Tatiana, thank you for the question, and, and I want to say that to all of you, not just to Tatiana, but to Tatiana and all of you, that I'm so sorry that you're all going through this, and don't lose hope, and patients that have a hard time getting pregnant very frequently get pregnant, so don't lose hope. But let's get back to this question. So, first of all, you've had PCS, PCOS your entire life, uh, number one. I, you may be 21 years old, or you may be 41 years old, but you've had PCOS uh, Probably when you were in the uterus, in your mother's uterus, you probably had PCOS. So yes, it is common to experience days of spotting and irregular bleeding uh, in between menstrual cycles. This can happen in the PCOS patient. Um, obviously, you can have anovulatory cycles. That's one of the main factors of PCOS. But you say after a month of acupuncture sessions. So the acupuncture nor herbs will worsen the PCOS. So if you got acupuncture and then you have, you know, some anovulatory cycles, 
remember, you've had anovulatory cycles undoubtedly in the past because that's what polycystic ovarian syndrome is. Um, and then you say, despite dietary and lifestyle changes, uh, you're still experiencing uh, anovulatory cycles and spotting. So what I want to say is, is that this is not at all uncommon uh, for the PCOS patient, number one. Number two, you know, acupuncture is a process-oriented modality. It's like exercising. It's like if you're going to run in the marathon, you know, you don't run two miles once and expect to go in the marathon. You have to train and keep training and keep training. Acupuncture is process-oriented. So, uh, you know, you have uh, how much acupuncture did you do after a month of acupuncture? Maybe you're going once a week. Even if you're going two times a week, you've had eight sessions. It's not enough to make any changes nor is it enough to hurt you, but that's not even a good statement because acupuncture cannot hurt you. Acupuncture, this is a very important thing to note. Acupuncture will not um, hurt you. It will either help you or it won't, but it won't hurt you. So just keep working, keep trying. Uh, and I think Western medicine would be good for you. I think taking letrozole uh, and doing some IUIs would be good because that kind of medicine will make you ovulate. Do the acupuncture to improve the egg quality. This is a perfect case for Eastern and Western medicine. Again, thank you so much for uh, sharing and also your question. And of course, as always, Mike, for your help with that. Thank you. Uh, now, a uh, very short forward question. So are you accepting new patients in your office? Yes, absolutely. Great. And of course, if you wish to get in touch with Mike, uh, there is a link where you can get in touch with him directly. It will be uh, forwarded to him and I'm sure he'd be happy to help you out as well. Okay. And let's have a look. Uh, there is another longer question. Can I ask you guys, just give me one second. Sure. I'll be right back. I just want to see if I have a patient waiting. I'll be right one second. No problem, Mike. Let's wait for you. Let's double check if there is someone right there. Uh, we can wait, right? So... Um, and also, in the meantime, let me remind everyone that if you have more questions, go ahead, type those in. Uh, as I can see, there are, there are only like two questions, so uh, we will be slowly finishing. So I just want to make sure okay. that you have answered, uh, ask all your questions. Yes, all good, Mike? All good. Perfect. So, so here's the question from Deborah. I was told to stop using the progesterone because after three months, they could not hear a heartbeat. Then I miscarried. What could have helped the... IDGR fetal dismiss tests what helps herbs and how long should I have acupuncture to have a healthy pregnancy? Um, so essentially you miscarried. I don't hi Deborah and, and thank you for, for joining us. Um, so you miscarried. I'm not sure what ID maybe you mean IUG or intrauterine growth retardation. Okay. What could have helped that? Um, well, first of all, we're not sure if you had intrauterine growth retardation, unless that's what the doctor said, but, but I don't really, it, it, okay. I see. Yep. Thank you. Okay. So you had intrauterine growth, growth retardation. So, um, what herbs and how long? Okay. So I cannot tell you what herbs and I'll explain why. So look, this is how I work. I have a new patient and I sit with the patient for an hour and I do an entire intake on the patient and everything is considered. How old is the patient? How much does she weigh? Uh, does she have a heart condition? How many times has she miscarried? Has she never miscarried? Has she ever been pregnant? Does she have children? Does she not have children? Uh, does she menstruate regularly? There's a million questions that one asks, not a million, but, but a lot to determine who this patient is, you know, physiologically, so to speak. Uh, and those questions enable me or somebody who does what I do to arrive at a differential diagnosis in traditional Chinese medicine and then write a customized herbal formula specifically uh, for that patient. Um, and so uh, I can't tell you what herbs to use. Um, and as far as how long you should utilize acupuncture, um, what the way I work is I treat patients twice per week until they're pregnant and then twice per week for 13 weeks. That's not answering your question. I know, but I'm going to. So the answer is I've treated patients for three months and I've treated patients for a year. 
Um, I don't typically treat patients for a year. I don't want to treat patients for a year. I want to treat patients for three to four months and have them be pregnant. But I've, it can take three months to a year to, to help a patient get pregnant. So I will stay with the patient until either they're pregnant or they fire me. Um, so I can't really say how many treatments you should get. Let me give you a good analogy. You go to the reproductive endocrinologist and you say, doctor, how many intrauterine inseminations am I going to have to get before I get pregnant? Doctor, how many IVF embryo transfers am I going to need before I get pregnant? The doctor's going to say, I don't know. So just keep getting treated until you're pregnant. And then once you're pregnant, keep getting acupuncture. And I recommend to everybody that you get it treated twice a week. You go to the gym. Anybody here goes to the gym. You're usually not going to the gym once a week. Sometimes you will. But people usually go to the gym three times a week, at least three times a week, because it's a process-oriented modality. So is acupuncture. Thanks so much. And as you can see, Deborah has you, Deborah. commented. <laughs> Thanks so much indeed, uh, Deborah, also for your question. And Mike, as always, you are always, always amazing with your answers. Love, the, love it for sure. Thank you. Um, okay. And maybe that might be our final question. So if you have any left, go ahead. Go ahead and do it. And let me show you this question. We, you mentioned this before, but if you can clarify that it means the acupuncture, actu sorry, acupuncture is not necessary if you are going for a donation. Yeah, I don't think acupuncture is necessary because look, the whole purpose of acupuncture in the context of fertility really is to improve egg quality, improve sperm quality, improve lining quality, and to help prevent miscarriage. So for example, you're 40 years old, and you're using a donor egg from a 23-year-old, and it's been tested, and it's normal. It's a euploidic embryo. It's, it's, it's chromosomally normal. Put it in, and you would typically, uh, let's put it this way. A donor egg has a 70% success rate. Let me point something out to you guys that you may or may not know. If you took two 18-year-olds, a boy and a girl, 18 years old, and she's ovulating, and they have intercourse, and he ejaculates into her during intercourse. Do you know what percentage she has of getting pregnant? 25%. 18 years old, he ejaculates into her, and she's ovulating. 25% chance she'll get pregnant. Donor egg has a 70% chance of success. So I think uh, if you're doing a donor egg and you don't have autoimmune issues, you don't have endometriosis, you, you don't have any issues i don't believe acupuncture is necessary okay perfect thank you so much once more for that okay. one more so question I can take maybe one more if you want and then i have to go because i'm gonna have patience of course not a problem and actually it looks like uh that will be our final question can you okay. use herbs with ssri absolutely 100 percent. so for those of you who don't know this is selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors this is an antidepressant um, yes, you can absolutely take acupuncture with it. They go to completely different pathways. Uh, there's no contraindication at all. In fact, you can use herbs while taking gonadotropins. Your reproductive endocrinologist will not want you to do so. And I'm not going to get into that because I have a patient and you guys have to go. But it's totally safe to use acupuncture with gonadotropins. It will not interfere with the gonadotropins it will not do anything negative and uh, it's safe to do but yes of course without doubt you can do it with ssris wonderful thanks so much in that case we will be finishing for tonight but that is all this is the final question as you can see thank you sir coming up your way mike you've been brilliant as always thank you everyone for joining for your incredible questions i do believe it has been very helpful as you can see the comments yourself mike yes, and uh I just want to mention this has been recorded. So if you would like to have a look at this once again, you will be able to find this tomorrow on our site, My Abbey Offenses. And if you would like to get in touch with Mike, you will be redirected to his profile on our website right after we finish. You can go ahead, do it. Uh, he's an expert. And as you can see, he's very happy to help anyone. And well, let's not wait, Mike. Uh, let's not make your patient wait as well. So. Thanks so much. Have a lovely evening and day wherever you are. And I do hope to see you here, Mike, very, very soon as well. Okay. I want to thank you so much for this opportunity and to all the participants. It's been most gratifying for me if I've been able to help you in the very least. I wish you all Godspeed on your journey to family and 
don't give up. You're going to get there. Love to all of you. Be well, be safe, and good luck. Perfect summary. So let's finish with that. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a good day. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.